Hello, you are listening to 411 Permanently Moved, an occasional audio project by me, Jay Springett, written, recorded and edited in 38 and a half hours between the months of March and May 2020. As above, so below. There is a war in heaven. After they fell from the weeping mother, they sought each to create their own worlds, worlds of their own logic and liking. The battle is endless, great waves crashing again and again against the shoreline of reality, the backwash still fighting, struggling for the upper hand, each vortex forming a current in history. The others may arrive mysteriously by campfire light and bring the war to us. Great knowledge, weapons, tools, dreams. The currents are redirected, damned or absorbed. Changing histories heave and swell, beware its riptides. The dark departs. We see each world in the bright light of day and new. The battle is in no body but ours. In no hands, no feet on earth but ours. We must forage, plant, tend, and sow. But in the dark of night, do not stray too far from the campfire's edge. Stay warm and keep together. Most of what follows is new material. Other parts are taken directly from my weekly podcast, 301permanentlymoved.online. This piece is a collage, one which considers detours necessary, tangents to add colour, shape and shade, subplots as weft picked up and dropped to support the whole, signposts stand throughout, promises made and direction delivered. Part 1. This is it. Permanently moved, 1903, interesting times. May you live in interesting times, a phrase that you've heard many, many times, I'm sure. In 1966, Robert F. Kennedy delivered a speech that included, quote, There is a Chinese curse which says, may he live in interesting times. Like it or not, we live in interesting times. There are times of danger and uncertainty, but they're also the most creative of any time in the history of mankind, end quote. Unfortunately, this story is a load of bollocks. There is no evidence that this phrase originated in China at all. The website Quote Investigator found that the earliest match for the phrase appeared in the Yorkshire Post in March of 1936. The expression was first used in a speech by the influential British statesman Sir Austin Chamberlain. He spoke of, quote, the grave injury to collective security by Germany's violation of the Treaty of Locarno. Sir Austin, who referred to himself as a very old parliamentarian, said, It is not so long ago that the member of the diplomatic body in London, who had spent some years in his service in China, told me that there was a Chinese curse which took the form of the saying, May you live in interesting times. There is no doubt that this curse has fallen upon us. We move from one crisis to another. We suffer one disturbance and shock after another. End quote. And there you have it. A very old white dude relaying a pithy expression from his mate who probably made it up but instead attached it to the wisdom of the Orient. But there's still more to this story. So Austin Chamberlain's father, Joseph Chamberlain, wrote in a speech in 1898, quote, I think that you will all agree that we are living in the most interesting of times. I never remember myself a time in which our history was so full in which day by day brought us new objects of interest and let me also say new objects for anxiety. End quote. So perhaps the phrase comes from the mind of Austin's father and became a foreign curse after the events of the First World War. I'd also like to note that New Objects of Interest, New Objects for Anxiety line echoes the message of Paul Verillo's invention of the ship is also the invention of the shipwreck. There is a clear implication, I think, that uninteresting times of peace and tranquility are more life-enhancing than interesting ones, which, from a historical perspective, usually include disorder and conflict. Indeed, Yaman Hegel wrote in the History of Philosophy, quote, History is not the soil in which happiness grows. The periods of happiness are in the blank pages of history, end quote. Even in 2003, Hillary Clinton released an autobiography that included an instance of the expression where she joked that Bill and her would ask each other, well, are you having an interesting time yet? The question I have about all of this is why? What is the truth about the phrase, may you live in interesting times, that makes it feel like a curse, perhaps even a truth so powerful that it becomes one, regardless of its origins? In 1944, in the depths of the Second World War, D.W. Brogan of the London School of Economics wrote that interesting times are, quote, times not to be made better by any simple formula. End quote. It's safe to say that we do indeed live in interesting times, but it is also essential that we ask or challenge the blank pages of history and ask interesting for whom.
Yes, we are living through catastrophic biosphere collapse, wealth inequality last seen by eyes and heads rolling into blood-soaked baskets, and of course the contemporary age of planetary scale computation. Last year I spoke a lot about living in a time like this, and strategies for living through it, but focus on your friends, family and loved ones. They actually do matter more than any of the problems I just mentioned previously. People in your life experience tragedy and apocalypse all the time. Sharing these with friends and helping other people through them is more important than worrying about the tides or times of history. Focus on the little things and make them better. The smear on the mirror that needs cleaning, the fraying seam of the jumper that needs sewing. Hold someone who's weeping like you will never let go. Introduction This is a product of six weeks of lockdown, written in fits of mania, each ending with a thud of the laptop lid, followed by an escape back into the rhythms of domesticity. If to listen is to think, what then is to write? Anne Lamott says that this is the business of becoming conscious. Being a writer is ultimately about asking yourself, how alive am I willing to be? It turns out that for me, most of being alive is currently about disregarding the things that have come before. I've had time to reread and revisit previous things I've written and done. Personal journals dashed out in the depths of depression and despair. Scratched out lines in notebooks. Music made for no one but me. Lockdown offered me an opportunity for an archival visit. Ideas, texts, music, work. Most of what I've ever made has been thrown aside. Returning to these things reanimate old emotions and memories from a time in which they were made. Things I'd also thought discarded. I wonder what in ten years' time I will make of this. Made in the midst of a pandemic, produced in the time of COVID-19. I, like many of you, have never felt this way before. I read old thoughts set down in fading pencil, reliving old grief for the climate and the world around me, a world that I never in fact knew. I pull a book of memories off the shelf and begin to read, an old black notebook with a tattered spine, tipex labelled with the year that I found my way to the top of the dark mountain. At its summit, I found, as the manifesto says, no deep revelation about the truths of human existence. What I found instead, however, was my lack of surprise at how easy it is to die. I had been there before. Crohn's disease, they told me, at 17. A permanent disease, an infection of my gut and bowel. So that was it. That was my life now. All the dreams I had imagined for myself as a kid would change forever. I joined the 70% of people with a disability in the UK whose disability was a hidden one. I already knew that before me was an unspooling future, potentially full of pain, danger and uncertainty. Operations, interventions, and like all people, my inevitable, death. The only question now was when, not if. From then on my life had new contours. A certainty, a fact, or a truth that now bent the shape of space-time in front of me. A wave that I could surf and with any luck, could also manage and control. There was a before and an after. Before the earthquake, after the landslide. A personal disaster that is still ongoing. A truth re-signalled every day with each beat in the routine of my daily medication. I discarded over 15,000 words making this. Tangents on territorialization and deterritorialization of COVID-19. Digressions into Hegel, the pre-Socratics. All ideas, perhaps, of some use at another time. It was, and has been, important to me to get them all out of me and onto a page. Once written down, the thinking stops for a while. All of those words, however, shared a single thread. This is it. A collective ending of old truths and certainties. Things are not ever going back to normal. No matter how short our memories and how strong the desire to slip back into old habits might be. It is a time, I think, to paraphrase Peter Gray, to offer the death rights to a culture that pretends that death can be cheated by buying the latest eye gadget or hooking ourselves up to plasma bags of young blood. These technological responses do not account for the wider environment which we do not control. For too long, narratives have relied upon an appeal to the benevolent Gaia, the caring earth goddess, a green vision of the world suffused with golden light brought to life as a catalogue of facts about the world on vivid HD flat screens, technology that is full of misery. 
destruction of the land for rare earth minerals to the moment the worker packed it into a box stamped with a malevolent Amazon grin. The image of the Earth Mother will help us with our grief, our pain and awe, and teach us to pay attention. But once that process is done, then we have to listen to the world with open eyes and see things afresh. As apes in concrete caves peeping out of doors and windows in the spring of 2020, what we sense is not the green goddess of nature, but instead what Corinne Boyer calls the wild adversary. An essence of and in the world that is not kind. There are forces abroad that are dark and dangerous. Dread. The wild is so named because it is beyond human comfort. This is a truth of the world. We are not apart from it, but embedded inside it. Civilization is a myth brought back from the campfire's edge, and it found fertile roots in our thinking. We have always relied upon our elders to steward or tell us that story in new and interesting ways, to remind us of our obligations and fine print to the bargain that put us on this earth. To quote Peter once again, our elders have failed us. They have not provided leadership. They have not provided counsel. They have been silent and compliant in the face of power. And those elders that did speak here in the UK, at least, did not reinforce the myths of our civilization. Instead, they said herd immunity. Daniel Barron recently wrote, What we are experiencing right now is the temporary death of the propaganda of consistency. What terror was once hidden now lies uncovered a slavering, smiling, systemic demon. The representatives of our machine, in frustration, cannot help but reveal that they would sacrifice our lives without hesitation as tribute to their Moloch. Curses. Spells. I've had a surprising number of messages from friends, family and clients asking for advice over the last few weeks. People I've worked for with suddenly nothing to trade. Everyone's broke, companies' revenue pipelines have collapsed, and friends have been made redundant. Others have laid shivering in the dark, dreaming of demons. A friend said to me the other day, The deeper into this we get, the more I see why. May you live in interesting times is the worst of modern curses. These interesting times, as we have seen, have only become a curse since someone has explained it so. Curses vary in intensity and form. We each deal with them in our own way. Curses are not punishment for sins. They do not balance the books. They are frames of reference or influence, a way of processing forces beyond one's control. There is a feeling, I think, that all of the crises currently unfolding around us are chickens coming home to roost. A feeling, I sense, that is widespread. Capitalism, environmental collapse, neoliberalism, the utter lack of any self-reflection after the last financial crisis. An elite only interested in stasis and a media environment so invested in illiquid history that they do not recognise a skirmish lost. The Iraq war, climate camp, the financial crisis are all lost battles along the road that brought us here. In the last decade, the consumption of news has largely been irrelevant to the forces that really matter. At its best, it was entertaining or enraging. At worst, irrelevant. Suddenly, the media is required to challenge power and inform the public. They have failed and are still struggling with both, trying to switch sides in a battle they didn't realise they were in. As I have mentioned, chickens coming home to roost is not about sins of the individual, or a society coming back to bite or haunt the individual. It is a phrase about understanding forces beyond one's control. Curses are like a bird that returns again and again to its own nest, wrote Chaucer in The Parson's Tale, around 1390. Curses returning to the nest is not blowback, there is no threefold law or the law of return. Only forces that keep influencing a person as they fail to take flight. The nest is a place of safety, not a place of haunting. I think deep down people know that the chickens coming home is actually about curses and not about deeds. Pestilence has always been one of the original curses upon the people. Curses work in a narrative universe, but so do spells. Permanently moved 2012 the run out. When a landslide occurs, the severity of the event is measured by the distance of its run out, i.e. the distance and depth that the landslide travels. The snow, mud or rubble 
follows the topology of the landscape following the route of least resistance. The global banking landslide that was the 2008 financial crash never actually came to rest. Its run out headed into civil society, culture, politics and other parts of the economy, manifesting as zero hours contracts and austerity and its extreme edge continues to creep along. The events of 9-11 were nearly 20 years ago but its effects also continue to run out, surveillance structures and Snowden. Globally, the COVID-19 landslide is still only just beginning to pour from the top of the mountain. How long and deep this run out will be is anyone's guess. Lego grad student went viral last week with the following tweet. If 20 formative years of your life involve a major terrorist attack, two recessions, exorbitantly expensive and unnecessary wars, tangibly worsening inequality, climate emergencies and incompetence during a global pandemic, it might just make you think things aren't good. The topology of the landscape the COVID-19 has begun to run into is a grand valley with very few obstacles, already a graveyard with rising waters at the mouth of its river, a denuded ecological and cultural landscape that this event is ploughing over and into. The effects of COVID-19 have only just begun. This run out doesn't end when we all re-emerge blinking into the early summer sunlight. The ground will continue to shift under our feet, soft and prone to collapse. It will be years, even decades until the earth has settled. Our descendants will live with the final effects of the current situation. I use landslide as a metaphor for two reasons. One, the long run out is a term I think with a lot of utility when thinking about events like these. Two, exponential laws are used in the study of them, as in epidemiology. A lot has been written about the exponential nature of pandemics. I won't repeat them here. However, it's important to understand the nature and feeling of an exponential trend. Writing in Nautilus magazine last week, Aubrey Clayton wrote the following. Nearly everything that has happened in the COVID-19 crisis has happened in the last week, but everything is happening faster every day. So guess what? A week from now, the same will be true. Nearly everything that has happened will have happened in the last week. Everything will accelerate. If we continue reacting too late, as we have, it will only slow down when the virus starts to run out of people new to infect. This feeling of speed is one that we are all experiencing and have been experiencing for a long time. Whilst it's dangerous to directly link or blame the outbreak on global capitalism, I have some sympathy for that point of view, as it elicits the same feeling. Our friend Lenin, of course, was entirely correct when he said, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. There is, of course, a strain of ontology or philosophy that has been talking about the nature of this condition for a while. Accelerationism. Accelerationism isn't a political project per se, but more of a philosophical explanation of the condition that we are all experiencing. It is born from the polis, where philosophy should be, not the ivory towers of academia. Matt Cahoon, aka Xenogothic, wrote on his blog last week, There is no such thing as being an accelerationist, because there's nothing I can do to impact the process of acceleration. It is something that is happening to us already, has been, for centuries. It's naive to think that any of us have our foot on the throttle of global capitalism. In that sense, accelerationism is a bad name. He goes on to quote someone else that accelerology might be a better term. Responding to that same essay, Paul Graham Raven noted, I am tempted to see acceleration as Cahoon sees it, which, I concede, may not be the universal conception of the term, as being a condition rather than a creed, in that sense that postmodernity was a condition rather than a creed. In both cases, the conditionality may suggest certain stances in response, and that's a very different thing to flag waving that says postmodernity, yay. I wonder then if accelerationism might be the term to replace the awkward placeholder terms like post postmodernity or alter modernity, etc. Given Cahoon's closeness to the thought of Mark Fisher, it might also be seen as the dialectical successor to capitalist realism, which, one might argue, is what the coronavirus pandemic is currently killing. Off. What it is not is a term synonymous with ethno nationalism or the idea that violence should be used to push Western countries into becoming failed states. Its appearance in the long rambling manifestos of the far right, I believe, is an acknowledgement of the experience of the condition. So today, from my isolated cave in southwest London, I can feel the landslide around me, peering over the cliff at the old world that is falling away, trying to project and see where its long run out will flow. At some point, we will all need to precariously pick our way down the slopes as we encounter more fellow travellers with whom we'll need to decide which route we intend to go. Our friend, Lenin. Six weeks into this pandemic, it is clear that it won't be over for a long time. All the current talk of the vaccine at this point is a media MacGuffin, one assuring us that we can beat back the wild adversary. We were for a long time told three more weeks of lockdown. This of course masked the reality, understating the more likely 18 months of extraordinary measures. Our political opposition here in the UK were calling for an exit strategy as the deaths were still mounting, a naive and short-sighted position doing no one any favours with many flaws. It is a line of thinking or a demand that implies returning to business as usual, and thinking that we could be back to normal any time soon 
is just deluded. As a society, we will be caught in the rhythm of the hammers and the dancers well into the future. Put your left foot in and take your right foot out. The question we must ask is, where exactly do we shake it all about? I think our elders know that reopening the economy won't save it. It can't be saved. It's not even the economy that they want to save. It is an act that will save capitalism. The awesome redistribution of resources has shown us that things could be a different way. To reopen is to simulate normality. But things just aren't going back to normal. We are all inside, in the liminal, the threshold that our, our doors are both physical and metaphysical. One that marks the boundary between two phases. There was a before, and now there is an after. I lost loads of followers right at the beginning of all this when I tweeted, all the most interesting periods in history begin with a good pandemic. I deleted it because I was getting a load of shit for it. But I didn't mean it in a flippant sense. I was serious. To repeat myself from episode 2010, the plague of Athens during the second year of the Peneplesian War literally created philosophy. The people of ancient Greece experienced a crisis of meaning very similar to the one that we are living through today, and they began to think their way out of the void. The plague of Athens revealed to the people of the ancient world that the old ways were no longer viable, old narratives were no longer true. There was a widespread feeling that the gods had not only abandoned them, but it was a time of war, too. We are stuck in endless wars against terror, drugs, want. They are all wars of story. The culture war is by and large a war about who gets to tell and shape the stories that get to call themselves a war. For example, we are not in a war against this virus. It is not a mugger that we must endure. It is a rescue mission. The imagery of war is misplaced and should be rejected for another form of story. The reconstruction of the Byzantine Empire began after the plague of Justinian. Afterwards, he enacted reforms to increase accountability and reduce corruption, the results of which was to lay the starting conditions for a thousand years of future history. Where can we find the signs of these foundations today? In the UK, we recently rejected the idea of not bailing out companies that avoid tax and pay dividends. The Bank of England is buying McDonald's debt without asking for influence over the say of the day to day extraordinary times. I think the stories we tell ourselves about recent history largely focus on the wrong things too. We value retelling ourselves the trauma of short wars over the everyday traumas of humanity. The entirety of the 20th century history is shaped by the pandemics of the 19th. These are, of course, largely glossed over amid the historical ins and outs of the First and Second World Wars. The heave and swell of the forces that act in and upon the world are set aside to place humanity at its centre. Richard J. Evans, writing in Epidemics and Revolutions, Cholera in the 19th Century, quote, Further cholera epidemics coincided with the overthrow of the Second Empire of France in 1871, and with disturbances in Russian Poland in 1892. Of all of the conjectures of epidemic and revolution, it is that of the 1848 has perhaps attracted the most attention amongst historians of the European continent. One of the earliest modern studies, edited by Louis Chevalier in 1958, was published as a part of a series of books on the 1848 revolution. But the British case in 1832 has also been intensively studied, and indeed, the general coincidence of cholera epidemics with the years of upheaval and revolution has proved too obvious to ignore. End quote. Whilst of course the opium wars and the famines in India are well known, the third plague pandemic is less so, which led to more than 12 million deaths in India and China, with about 10 million killed in India alone. It began in 1855, and the World Health Organization estimates that it only ended around 1960. You can read about the British colonial administration's response to the pandemic on Wikipedia. If you do go and read it, let me know if you think it reminds you of anything. There are so many things that I could talk or write about. History is important, but the short version is that there is nothing new about our current situation except the page number and the chapter of the story that we find ourselves in. The future, of course, will be like the past, only more so. We are where we are, starting from. The reason that I brought up historical plagues is that pandemics always rewrite the rulebook and change the landscape. Events such as these cast long shadows and shape our future stories. Countries around the world have already thrown away the supposed rulebook, cash payments directly to citizens, huge injections of cash into the real economy. The ECB has demanded tight fiscal rules, but now that they affect Germany, 
that's going out the window. Even the Jupiterian technocrat Macron acknowledges that it's the state's responsibility to step up swiftly when needed and put its citizens first. All of this will not be enough. Things are being handled poorly in the US and the UK because the Austrian school has so many taproots dug deep into the cores of our institutions. For all the right-wing yelling about the Frankfurt School's influence in the academy, we now see that the capture of the political and economic class by neoliberalism and its modern interpretations of the Austrian school has been a disaster. I do not need to talk at length about the effect austerity has had on our resilience. The lack of action following exercise Cygnus in 2016 is just one of the many ongoing scandals. Brexit consumed the state, and inshallah, we have more of that to come. To talk of any kind of exit is in fact to talk about an exit from our current narratives. To do so, we should look towards one of its main storytellers, Thatcher. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the quote, there is no such thing as society. But let's put that quote back into context. Quote, they are casting their problems at society, and... You know, there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women and there are families. And no government can do anything except through people. And people must look after themselves first. It is our duty to look after ourselves and then also to look after our neighbours. End quote. At its root, the Austrian school that captured our institutions believed that there are interdependent social systems and institutions that bring a sense of order to human affairs. Society is the sum total of all of these systems, including common law, our practice of ritual, and customs handed down through generations. It believes that this evolving order allows individuals to give expression to their personal choices, and, by those choices, systems and institutions are shaped through continuous adaption. This view of society, of course, was still new at the time of the creation of their philosophical framework. Society, as it is viewed through this lens, only emerged through the industrialization of the 19th century. Due to the effects of 40 years of neoliberalism, many of the interdependent social systems that early members of the Austrian school observed in the world have now begun to fall away, dissolved. Curtis Yarvin, technologist and extremely controversial blogger who literally coined the metaphor red pill amongst the online right, recently diagnosed something similar in his long read, Plan A for the Coronavirus. The terrible truth the virus has revealed is that the US and the UK, as opposed to post-communist Asia and post-Napoleonic Europe, are not even countries. They are free trade zones. Our governments are not governments. They are bureaucratic anarchies with ceremonially elected monarchs. Pitting them against this ruthlessly objective virus is like sending Don Quixote to Vietnam. The Austrian school's successors, Blair, Cameron, Obama, etc., shrugged at the situation they had inherited and didn't care. The next quarterly growth reports and stock market numbers were due in at any moment. The interdependent social systems that have made up our society for centuries have been hollowed out. Many of these groups were also dues paying. To pick names off the top of my head from the post-war period, Rotary Club, Round Table, Women's Institute, Working Men's Clubs, Amateur Dramatic Societies, Parish Church Groups, all are struggling for membership in 2020. However, as we'll discuss in part two, there are already signs of change. The rapid formation of mutual aid groups in the early days of the crisis here in the UK have already entrenched themselves in the daily lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Even by the Austrian school's own terms, these are newly formed interdependent social systems based on solidarity. After any pandemic, the evolving order that the people who would run the world call society will have adapted and reformed without their supervision, and they are scared of it. Scales fall. We are now at the end of the long 20th century. What James Kushner called the long emergency, a far more apt and poetic name, and Yuk Hoi recently called it the 100 years of crisis. Astrologically, it is a time of closing out the books. Populations of many countries have seen in the last week just how quickly the awesome power of the state, and let's be clear, it is awesome power, daunting, given to it by the people, an entity that can reorder society if it so wishes. Reality can be reshaped in a week, a day, or as we've seen, hour by hour. Our institutions have always just lacked the will, alongside the lockdowns and the remarkable financial measures being instituted. The magic money tree is a perennial arboreal metaphor that is planted in the UK with regularity. The problem our media and political classes see with money trees is that it will change the view from their gilded towers. Of course, the roots of any money tree can be used also to attempt to bind the soil and maintain stability. It is illustrative that in the UK, the first money trees that were planted 
were to bind the markets before more were planted again to bind the people. They will continue to be planted for a short time to maintain legitimacy, but the whole mountain is sliding into the valley. Perhaps some trees will weather the tumult, but many will be swept away by the wave of destruction. High street chains that colonised our high streets in the 80s and 90s are collapsing. Even Kath Kidson cannot keep calm and carry on. Other well-known brands are rent striking. I say well-known brands rather than well-loved, who would shed a tear over the Arcadia Group or Debenhams. I care for its employees and fear for many shop stewards' futures, but will come back to fashion. During and after the run-out, the new soil available will not be fertile topsoil. Governments will continue to plant large money trees, but will try to sow a cover crop of fast grasses and ruderal species, a mix of seeds that will attempt to trick people into rebuilding the world exactly as it was before everything fell down the mountain. This cannot be allowed to happen, as we shall see in part two. We need to have our own sacks of cover crop ready to sow. It is up to us to save and store this seed and sprout some seedlings now, not later. Seeds are not just a metaphor here, I also mean literal seeds. The politics of seeds and crops is one fraught with colonialism and the arrogance of power. Rowan White, seed keeper from the Mohawk community, says that seeds carry much more than the blueprint of the plant that they can become. Encoded in seeds are ceremonies, the songs, and stories, lineages, and migration stories of the people who harvest and sowed them before us. There are many, of course, who prefer to forget or ignore the stories of the seeds that make up the cover crop of reality. I'm not ashamed to admit that I have Tory acquaintances. They too have begun to express outrage that the cruel, callous government they voted for is now doing nothing to help them, personally. Some of this comes from the weak self-employment bailout, some of it comes from the empty supermarkets, some of it from the disbelief at the handling of the whole situation in general. Londoners, previously untouched by the run-out of austerity, are finally experienced the ground beginning to shift below their feet. There is the observation by everyone that the rates of mortality we have been seeing could and should have been lower. These figures have nothing to do with the virus itself, but rather the systems in place to deal with such an eventuality. I believe that the encrusted scales will continue to fall from people's eyes as the landslip becomes a landslide. I wonder what folks will make of Brexit as this current crisis continues to unfold, regardless of previous political affiliation. In the UK, the government and media's response to the current crisis has been led by the public. It turns out that the hipster analysts were correct and the science they're being led by wasn't really science at all. It was a position bound by the limits of political opinion. Boris's Churchillian routine wore thin, quickly, shaking hands with everyone all the way into the ICU, no doubt. The problem of the media class being so close to power in the administration that became so evident during the election last year is even more exacerbated in this time of crisis. There is a revolving door. You don't even need to squint to see it. My local council is sending out more useful and practicable information. Yet I would never have known this or even been informed if I hadn't made an effort at the beginning of this year to be more informed about local politics. I doubt my neighbours are aware of the daily updates going out. I hope this event will solidify the message that the market does not and should not have the primacy over people. The state has enormous powers that can be used usefully and subtly. Going forward, anyone who is worried about the impact of 0.2% of GDP growth for ecological restoration and climate change measures, or even housing the homeless, can absolutely go do one. We should not accept any attempt to return to business as usual after this event. The other day, the price of oil went negative. CLOs are also being downgraded. Pension funds, neoliberal further education, and other core institutional elements of the global and local financial economy are creaking at the seams. The run out here may have only just begun to pick up steam. Titans topple. So many things once thought permanent now look precarious, even dangerous. Airlines, the oil industry, cars and parts of the electronics industry the landslip has swept industries from their feet and they have nothing to hold on to. Many of them are also complex financial instruments as much as they are elements of industry, providing any real value. Over the last five years, American Airlines spent $11.9 billion on stock buybacks and paid out over $1 billion in dividend. As we speak, Virgin Australian planes are impounded on the runway in Perth. Solid yellow JCBs demanding it pay its debts, reaching $6.8 billion dollars. On April the 3rd, the CEO of Wizz Air said that most European airlines have badly mismanaged their liquidity, 
Now they're all begging for state support. By April the 21st, Wizz Air had announced they were taking 300 million bailout from the UK government, despite holding 1.5 billion in reserves. The global meat industry, after cutting down our forests and jungles, is now euthanizing its cattle, tourism, freight, transport, wholesale goods, construction and agriculture, all wrapped up in the global landslip. You become a financialized industry when you believe yourself immortal. Just as states become economies, titans become casinos. Yet some prefer stasis and denial, where Iron Air said it won't fly if they had to introduce wider spacing with its seats. Heaven forbid that the health and the comfort of the public be protected and improved. BA and EasyJet are not refunding anyone, instead offering theoretical vouchers for theoretical travel. Today, BA also announced 12,000 job losses without any consultation with the unions. In the Greek myths, the titans came first, masters of the globe. Like many of the industries in trouble, in this moment, they once believed themselves indispensable and eternal. But then the new gods came and banished the titans to Tartarus forever. How do we, in 2020, begin to undermine and overwhelm these figures? Let us zoom in. Treasures on Earth We've been inside for some time. No one I know has bought any new clothes. Obviously, people still are, though, but I wonder if everyone who has actually needed them. Does the impulse to consume impressed upon us by nearly a century of advertising do anything to validate one's sense of self in the middle of a pandemic? I'm not sure. Perhaps there is a hangover. Shop online to alleviate boredom. The ASOS warehouse has been called a cradle of disease. Yet another industry built on chains of human misery and environmental destruction. I will not shed a tear for the collapse of fast fashion. The industry, or any of its owners, or even at the loss of the high street. Solidarity with its workers though. Wash your hands, join a union, fight together for a better world. I was 14 when Naomi Klein's No Logo came out. All of my older friends in the hardcore punk scene were instantly jazzed about it. I didn't actually end up reading it until much later, at some point during university. By then, we are already in a different world. WTO protests against globalism quieted by the war on terror. The title was alone enough for me at the time. It told me everything teenage me needed to know, at once an instruction and a command. As a difficult teenager, I refused to wear anything with a logo, much to my mother's chagrin, trawling round shops trying to find blank hoodies, coats and jumpers. It is difficult to overstate the extent to which I dislike fast fashion. I struggle to identify what year a photo has been taken in a lot of the time, as these images fix me in time and wearing the same things across decades. When asked by her colleagues about me recently, my girlfriend said, well, he does wear his dead grandparents' clothes. I think that's one of the only things they need to know about me. In many respects, that's all you need to know. I fear that I may be falling into a familiar rant. But anyways, we must continue. It is clear that fast fashion is and should be over. Low-priced clothing of mediocre quality, sold rapidly by mass-market retailers that follow the latest manufacturing trends. The whole idea is bananas. In 2015, the fashion industry consumed nearly 80 billion cubic metres of fresh water, emitted over a million tonnes of CO2 and produced 92 million tonnes of waste. It's about the same amount of fresh water used as Mexico. It is completely unacceptable. I sometimes walk round shops, tutting at things with unfinished seams, loose threads, etc., all there just hanging on the rack. It's not to besmirch the people that made them, of course. I'm sure that they would have liked to have finished them too. But the fastness of the fashion doesn't care. It wants to sell something that should be 50 quid if everyone was paid equitably and treated fairly, including the environment. But instead, fast fashion sells it for £5. Even pre-pandemic, the tide of bullshit was beginning to turn. High street brands everywhere were looking shaky. The brands that still seem confident, to me, seem to be those of higher quality and have a slower turnover of styles. Our friend Saint Condo has also contributed bigly to this changing view. The piles of clothes on one's bed is an image of our times. It is truly wild that our grandparents and great-grandparents wore clothes that were much, much higher quality than the ones we wear today. True, they didn't own nearly as many items, and Sunday Best was, is, a literal thing. They are expensive and so they should be, but they were also made by someone down the road 
or someone from your church. As the run out continues, we need to collectively decide what are the things that need saving. Zara has flagged a 24.1% decrease in sales in the first two weeks of March. H&M says it saw a 46% drop in the same month. There are other panic retailers like CNA, Gap, Primark, Topshop, Debenhams, and whilst it's not anything to do with fashion exactly, Unilever is crying over the fact that people have abandoned deodorant. I say, fuck them. We should all demand more from the items we bring into our lives. Demand more of the titans that influence our lives. When the shops finally do reopen, don't go. Don't buy anything. Fuck fast fashion. Offer them no lifelines. Let the industry fall away down the mountain and let us only salvage the things of quality and longevity. Everything you own is probably already fine. As this period has shown, there are more important things in life than trying to make yourself feel better by buying a new top, a new pair of trainers. Learn to sew, fix, and mend. End of the Anthropocene. I hate the PSYOP Anthropocene. The sheer peak arrogance of it. The period which we tell ourselves in which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. That it was originally suggested by geologists to denote the visibility of humanity's impact in the geological record has already been surpassed and forgotten. The arts and cultural industries took up the word as a banner, marched it forward believing that they were doing their bit for the environment. Institutions pretended that their city slicker bougie concerns were relevant rather than actually making anything happen at all. Instead, that period last decade became a parody of horrors in art galleries, museums and undergraduate essays. Look what we've done, they said, in an attempt to somehow shame others into perceiving the problem. But during many of the events I watched and attended last decade, to my ears, I did not detect any shame. Instead, there was some kind of human pride. Look at what we've done to the world. We've named this new historical era after ourselves. Friends, I'm sorry if I'm offending some of you. But in general, I genuinely believe that the period that I'm referring to is a dark one for the arts and cultural complex. We might as well have all just queued up for more quaint sightseeing tours and boarded the Anthropocenic Railway and sung It's a Small World after all. It is not to say that the art and work produced was bad. Some of it was actually very, very good. Vital, even. But much of it, for me, fell flat. I had already grieved for the world. The glamour of the Anthropocene also denied a history of humanity. We burnt so much effort in discussing this new human epoch that we collectively ignored and failed to offer thanks to our ancestors that lived through the real human epoch, the Holocene, a short era in anyone's estimation against the grand drama of humanity's total history. All of what we call quote-unquote civilization has happened during the Holocene. All of the preceding history that led to our current moment and set of crises our ancestors lived through it all. They dealt with plagues, coughs, fevers, famines, droughts, floods, wildfires, and much more. All of this just 10,000 years long, 350 generations. And right at the beginning of that chain stands Gobekli Tepe. As Gordon White says in the book Starships, before we knew how to farm, before we lived in villages, before we even knew how to make pots, we built a star temple on a hill. A temple built in the middle of a landscape that would have been as much of a nowhere then as it is today. They brewed beer, it might even have been hallucinogenic, but without any doubt they would have danced, cried and sang, loved, lost and lost loved ones. And 30,000 years even before that, 40,000 years before today, in a world completely different from our own, people were laughing and chatting and dancing whilst carving sculptures like the Lion Man. The experience of being human is just the same today as it was back then. The entire period of time since we reached collectively what anthropologists glibly call cultural modernity. The Anthropocene is an arrogant word. It is almost as arrogant as the word nature. I have, I hope you will note, been careful with my language so far. The only time I've used it was in relation to Gaia, the Great Mother. When you interrogate the word nature, it disintegrates like a moth's wing under any kind of inspection. The process of its dissolution highlights so many of the problems that we have when trying to talk about the world around us. The pandemic, like a flood or a fire, is an important reminder that humanity is not apart from the world. We are deeply embedded in it. So when did nature start? Or more excitingly, when does it end? What is natural? All of these questions are bound up in the confidence of empire and Western empirical science. 
Endless rows of bugs under glass labelled with names, written in a dead language, all pinned to a wall. Collected, classified, and categorised. David George Haskell wrote in The Forest Unseen that we live in an empiricist's nightmare, that there is a reality far beyond our perception. Our senses have failed us for millennia. Only when we mastered glass and were able to produce clear, polished lenses were we able to gaze through the microscope and finally realise the enormity of our former ignorance. We are still so ignorant today. St Ingram only uncovered how the food web worked back in 1999, and Monica Gagliano is currently upending everything we know about cognition and memory in plants, doing so with the plants not as subjects, but partners. We lack a clear and precise language to describe the world around us. The term native species is just as racist as mustachioed men in imperial uniforms sipping tea and discussing the natives. Invasive, exotic, endemic, naturalised. One of the greatest projects our society needs to embark on here in the West is to shed our language and thinking of these terms. We don't and shouldn't ever use them when we talk about people, and we shouldn't use them when we talk about plants either. Decolonization is one of the most important projects of our generation. The decolonialization of science, doubly so. Why do we say that the only plants and trees that were in this area when some white dude saw them and wrote it down 200 years ago are what's natural in this place in this time? Our ancestors, and perhaps even Neanderthals, filled Europe with hazel. Polynesian seafarers brought at least 23 different types of plants and trees with them to Hawaii as partners in their endeavour. Not just plants but people. The question that you must ask yourself is whether the plants have agency too. What exactly is it about lawn grass that convinced humans to cultivate it across vast areas of the earth? I could continue to look in amongst the shifted topsoil of the landslip to find the mushrooms and mycelia, but that is a discussion for another time. COVID-19 has been an important reminder to us all, I think, that we are not the masters of this earth. We shouldn't kid ourselves that there's been any other way. We need to urgently change our language and our thinking. There is no war against the virus. It is no enemy. It just is. The capital T truth is that we are both of the world and inside the world. Active participants in its creation. Yes, partners to some and antagonists to others. But we are all at the mercy of the wild adversary. This is it. Back in 2015, St Atwood wrote a long read on Medium called It's Not Climate Change, It's Everything Change, and in it she said the following. Like every other species on the planet, we are conservative. We don't change our ways unless necessity forces us. The early lungfish didn't develop lungs because it wanted to be a land animal, but because it wanted to remain a fish even as the dry season drew down the water around it. Perhaps now, during the first major pandemic of the 21st century, we can break out of some of our conservatism. It is a crisis that should bookend the long emergency that began with the pandemics of the 19th. Everything change. Roll the words around in your head. Say them out loud if you have to. Try them out. See how they feel in the mouth. How do they make you feel? Everything change. Abra, cadabra. I create as I speak. And now say... This is it. All that we have known to be solid and stable has slipped away. The time ghost is at the door. Like the ancient Greeks of Athens, the great green goddess of Mother Earth has seemingly abandoned us, and if we stray too far from the campfire, we might meet Rona. The run-out has begun. One of my most read blog posts last year, I tried to summarise what most important thinkers to me seem to have in common, and I wrote the following. You do not know what the fuck is going on. Your job is to be absolutely certain that you have no idea what the fuck is going on. And from that raw chaos, that raw uncertainty, as a default state of being, learn how to feel, how to move forward and act in the world. Witness, comprehend, inhabit. This whole piece has been an attempt to articulate some of the above. Perhaps I should have just said that right at the beginning. We have absolutely no idea what is going to happen. Clouded, the future is. The only thing that we can be certain of is that there is no certainty at all. Let us return for a moment to the other metaphor, the state planting trees to bind the soil on the slopes. What kind of things have they planted beyond the paltry crumbs thrown at the table of human welfare so far? The massive bailouts into an economy they can't even be sure that could be saved. 
negative oil prices, an alarming and swift push for a total biosurveillance, a crackdown on civil liberties and our freedoms of assembly. Microsoft has a patent application for a cryptocurrency system tied to human implantable chips. And Google and Apple are building a tracking system to save us from ourselves. Palantir, of course, is already on the job too. And the always grinning giant Amazon is making $11,000 a second, an institution that some people estimate powers up to 50% of the entire internet. The technology, along with the retail that powers it, have shown themselves to be public utilities. Today as I write this script, the UN released a report concerned at the authoritarian responses, surveillance, closed borders, and other rights abuses that are taking place under the fog of this so-called viral war, a health crisis that is fast becoming one of human rights too. We face infinite quantitative easing, years of rolling lockdowns, and the surveillance industry either moving in or merely just dropping its disguise. This time is being used by those with well-laid plans to put them into action. I don't think it's a conspiracy to say that this interregnum is an effective vector for them to advance the specific set of plays. And yet, there's more. As we sit in concrete caves, there's a mega drought emerging in the western US that might be worse than any in 1,200 years. The ongoing and alarming plague of locusts in East Africa, a disaster so serious that it is being prioritised over efforts to prepare for the virus. Why? Because locusts, like us, prefer carbohydrates. There's also been serious crop failures in India, China and Middle America. And the impact of the many devastating recent wildfires across the globe is only just coming to light. Kelp forests, coral reefs and the deep sea food chains are all collapsing. This is not a drill. What we could be facing this year around the world is a famine that the World Food Programme had described as biblical. They estimate that 36 countries are facing unimaginable horror. Ten of these countries already have more than one million people in the verge of starvation, in addition to the 135 million people already facing crisis levels of hunger. 2020, when counted amongst the 821 million people already chronically hungry, could be the year that we see more than one billion people pushed into dire situations. That's one in seven. With memories fresh of empty shelves in supermarkets, perhaps we are all now a little more aware of the fragility of our food supply systems, built on global supply chains and just-in-time fulfilment. It is now only a short jump from countries hoarding their own PPE and medical supplies to hoarding food. The Eurasian Economic Union just banned staple food exports until the 30th of June, and the largest US meat company just warned that the food supply chain is breaking down. With slaughterhouses and processing plants forced to shut, there are too many animals waiting to be fed into the global machine that has stopped grinding. Our global system of interconnected supply chains that was slowly built around us in the name of consumer choice cannot operate in a world of balkanisation and hard national borders. Things need to be rethought urgently. There are already bred tailbacks at food banks in the US. In the UK, one in 14 people have used a food bank at some point since the financial crisis. Last year, the Trussell Trust found that 94% of its users were facing real destitution and able to buy essentials to stay warm, dry, clean and fed. We too here in the West could be looking at the year when we leave our homes and find the supermarket just as empty as they have been recently. A great deal of alarm has already been raised around UK food security. Speaking of hard national borders, much of it flagged and surfaced by Brexit planning but ignored. Just like our preparedness for the pandemic, combining the two we are facing a shortfall of 80,000 agricultural workers. Brexit now seems like a quaint storm in a teacup compared to what we could be facing. But it is not quaint and it is not fear-mongering to say that we could be facing some very severe issues. This is it. So what, to quote our friend Vlad once again, is to be done? In the next episode of 411, we will discuss part two, visionary mode. End. Well, 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 that was nearly 40 hours of work to make. I hope you liked it, or at least found some of it interesting anyway. Feels good to put some cards you've been holding in the burn pile. Part 2, Visionary Mode, will be out, or rather, begin in the next few weeks. I changed my mind about what form I wanted it to take the other day, so things were a little up in the air. But like I said, 411 is an occasional audio project. 301 will be back on Friday with 5 more minutes of weekly content made in 1 hour as usual. If this is your first time listening, you can subscribe to Permanently Moved at permanentlymoved.online or search in all your favourite podcatchers. Eventually, a transcript of this series will be available as issue 2 of my zine at startselectreset.com. You can head over there now for issue 1. 
your attention is sovereign. In the meantime, you can find me writing on my blog at www.thejmo.net or on Twitter as at thejmo. I would also like to thank Gordon White for his friendship and support over the years. The rescue mission, the salvage mission, the campfire's edge, star temples on hills in deep time. Many ideas and influences on my work and in this essay stem from him. If you are hearing this thank you to Gordon White, then it's because you are listening to a re-uploaded version of this essay. The original version, I used and referenced his ideas without credit and without thanks. That was unacceptable behaviour on my part. One of my most long-held and firm beliefs is that in order to foster a mutual flourishing with benefits to all who participate in a community of thought or action, one must give judicious and generous credit wherever possible. I deeply regret my error in judgment and wish to apologise to him directly here. I recognise my failing and will be sure to correct it. It's a sentence that should be said from the heart and then acted upon. This is part of my action. It would be an understatement to say that his work and thought has been a huge influence on my life, and so too our friendship. This familiarity, however, is no excuse to become blind or uncaring towards one's influences. Sometimes, lessons learnt can come with great costs. One must act as quickly on those learnings as possible. This is a lesson that I will not need to be taught a second time. It won't ever happen again. Thank you, Gordon. Before I go, I'd like to say a big thank you to Eve Warman, Hugh Lemmy, Kia Kreutler, Alex Andrews, Ben Vickers, Kane Bidwell, Alex Fredera, and CK. Solidarity with NHS staff, key workers, and anyone with family or friends affected by the wild adversary. Cheers.